Hello, and welcome to Calming the Chaos, where we present tips, tools, and techniques to help you find peace in a chaotic world. I'm your host, Tracy Canella, licensed mental health counselor at Lokahi Counseling. This channel and the Calming the Chaos podcast is for those who want self-help and education. It's not a substitute for counseling or psychotherapy. So if you like the information, please subscribe to my channel and share it with your friends. Thanks so much for listening. And now, let the chaos begin. This episode of Calming the Chaos is called Holiday Food Chaos. And so if you've ever wondered why some people get really freaked out around food this time of year, you'll want to tune in for my interview with Stacy Shilter Paisano. And Stacy is a licensed marriage and family therapist. She's also a certified eating disorders specialist and an eating disorders specialist supervisor. And she is the site manager of the Emily program in Lacey, and they treat eating disorders at every level of care. And we talk about triggers, food-related triggers, family-related triggers, and all of this stuff that has to do with food, eating, and body image that can really spike up around the holidays. I'm really super happy to talk with Stacy, as I always am. And so let's take a listen to our interview. So we're here with Stacy Shilter Paisono, and we are actually going to be talking about calming the holiday food chaos. So what we really want to get across to people is from two experts on eating disorders. In fact, we are both able to supervise people who want to be certified in eating disorders. We know our stuff. So we would like to be able to educate people out there about why people experience chaos around food during a time of year where people are eating all the time. And what is their thinking like? And so you can develop an understanding for these individuals. So I'm just so happy to have my colleague and my friend here, Stacy. welcome to Calming the Chaos. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here and really excited about this opportunity to help people become more aware of some of those holiday food triggers and some of the chaos that occurs for an individual who struggles in their relationship with food. And I think it's really terrific that um, we're talking and helping educate people. Yeah, what do you think that people just don't understand about people who go into the holiday season and they start to be scared around food and triggering being emotionally triggering and fear being one of the most prevalent emotions that I can think of anyway. Mm -hmm. What do you think that you would like to be able to talk about first as far as um, understanding the mindset of a person who goes into a holiday with fear of food. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it feels really relevant to talk first about all of the things that a person might be trying to manage or trying to cope with as they are approaching a holiday or what's happening for that individual, you know, leading up to a holiday experience, um, what might be going through their mind and why that is. Because there's so many stressors that occur for a person who struggles in their relationship with food beyond what any other person might define as stressful about the holidays. I think anyone in our world would say, oh yeah, the holidays are stressful, but to develop an understanding of how complex that stress can be for a person that's struggling with a clinical eating disorder or a disordered relationship with food. Yeah, so how distressing it can be. I, I love that you bring the fact that it's already distressing for some people who don't struggle with food. It's, mm -hmm. it's the holidays. So we're under some stress anyway. Mm -hmm. And, and then when we add food into the equation, so we've got a couple of different areas. I think what uh, you were talking about 
internal and external uh, triggers that we are looking at with people mm -hmm. who struggle with food. If you want to share a couple of them that you think are especially relevant at this time? Absolutely. And I'm glad you asked about that because I think when we are breaking it down a little bit, we're looking at external stressors, internal stressors, and food-related stressors. So there's all these different components. Um, I first want to say that individuals that struggle in their relationship with food, I think, um, are predominantly thinking about what they ate, what they will eat, what they weigh, what they look like, all of these different things. And so when we have that level of preoccupation, oftentimes above 60% of the time, you know, and then we're dealing with these external and internal stressors, it just adds to those layers of complexity. So getting into some of those external stressors, um, I would first say like family dynamics or family together time can be really distressing for some folks. Um, also on the flip side of that is isolation during an expected time of togetherness. So particularly right now with COVID happening and perhaps people aren't getting together with their extended family members, that time of isolation can also be really challenging because there is that perceived idea that other people are getting together and I'm alone. And that can be really um, distressing or activating in and of itself. I think along with those things, obviously, we have some uh, financial difficulties or, you know, concerns about finances during the holiday season. We've got busy schedules happening um, during non-COVID times. People are sometimes traveling, taking time off work. I mean, we've got a whole host of different things. Um, also, when we think about college students, for example, returning home for the holidays, a little bit of personal disclosure. Um, when I went home for the holidays, the first, my freshman year of college, one of my dad's first comments was about how much my body had changed. And it was really activating for me at that time and really problematic. And so along with returning home for the holidays are sometimes comments that people make about the way that somebody's changed or how different a person looks and an appearance related um, feedback that is really distressing for an individual that maybe struggles with body image um, or flip side of that being away from home on the holidays. So we've got all of these different things going on that could be really hard. We're going to be embarking on Thanksgiving in just a couple of days. So students have returned home for from college and then you know even the people who aren't in college but are gathering with their families are going to be sort of I don't know, I guess, would you say the people would be commenting and making observations, criticisms, like maybe your dad made an observation, but mm -hmm. it can be taken and interpreted in a certain way in the, in the mind of a person who struggles with food. It may mean that I'm this, or I'm that, or I'm not enough, or I'm too much, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But family dynamics would be a good place to start here because Families are getting together T minus 48 hours right now. <laughs> so we, are, we are embarking on it, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that is something, you know, that people should really be aware of their appearance related comments that get made. I think in general, but also during the holidays, being aware of appearance related comments about their loved one, being aware of appearance related comments they make about themselves, particularly with COVID right now. I read a statistic recently that there's been more than 15,000 different memes or advertisements about COVID and its impact the impact of isolation on our body shape and size because people are eating more, eating less or whatever it is. And so I think people can really practice being aware of body or appearance related comments that get made because those can be perceived so differently from one person to the next. And in general, I like the rule of thumb of not making appearance related comments in our lives or during the holidays because we just don't know how they're gonna land. Exactly. Saying something like, uh, you look great, you've lost weight, or, oh my gosh, looks like you got that COVID-19. <laughs> Those are in general not helpful. Even the you look great, you've lost weight comment may be interpreted uh, as something that could be a negative, like, oh, well, I guess I have to stay this, this weight my whole 
rest of my life or else somebody won't love me. I mean, that it could mm-hmm. get that extreme in, in the mind of a person who struggles with food. So mm-hmm. yeah, right. in general, leaving those comments out of your dialogue then, is that what you're mm-hmm. saying? Yes, absolutely. Because to your point, I think somebody that maybe has been dieting or even restricting their intake intentionally, um, that is complimented on weight loss, you know, they do receive that as a compliment. They do wonder like, oh, well, what they think of me before if I'm getting this compliment now. And if some is good, maybe more is better. And they're continuing to strive for that weight loss. And it takes their focus so much more in that direction than it needs to be. So I think it can be helpful, you know, to avoid those comments and or give feedback or compliments based on something else, like a trait that somebody is exhibiting or a strength that you're noticing or somebody's energy level, or you seem so bright or something of that nature, as opposed to a body related comment. Yeah. And how about just like, it's so good to see you. I've missed Absolutely. you. I love sharing time with you and Absolutely. you're so fun to be around. Mm-hmm. All yeah. good things. Yes. I was saying that about you, Stacey, right there. Oh, thank you. It's <laughs> wonderful to be here. <laughs> thank yep. you. That is a great example of how we can greet our own family members without making the body or weight related comments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what about family and food and the comments that happen when we're, well, let's just be honest. We're not sitting at the table. We have food laid out when we walk in the door, right? Mm-hmm. And So what about the comments that people make about eating too much, eating too little, what you eat healthy versus non-healthy, the pressure to eat when possibly we're not hungry. This is like maybe at the end of the evening when we've already had enough or Mm -hmm. judgment about our eating choices. So when we're faced with food and people at the same time, it's like, Hmm, let's see, alcohol and fire <laughs> equals whatever, right? Explosion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. can you tell me a little bit about your experiences or what comes to mind when you think about food-related comments people might make on the on the days of the celebrations. Absolutely. Yeah. So what first comes to mind is people's commenting on food of their own choosing. So that might be, you know, somebody that you're visiting or a a mom or an aunt or whomever saying, oh, I shouldn't be eating this or today's my cheat day or any diet related messages that are made about food can be really activating and can have a person maybe judging themselves or thinking about those diet messages as opposed to just enjoying food, you know, for what it was made for, what it was designed for, what the person making it did with it, whatever it is, like we have that opportunity to enjoy it and take pleasure in the food that is available to us. Um, I also think any comments or pressure, you mentioned pressure, that are made about you should eat more or that doesn't look very balanced or man, that's a really large plate. As somebody that dealt with an eating disorder myself, I had a person say to me once, wow, you can really put it away. And I'd been in recovery for years at that point, but that comment was so alarming to me and distressing because it did have me thinking like, oh gosh, am I eating too much? Should I not have plated this much? You know, so I think any comments about somebody's own eating experience or somebody else's eating experience just isn't necessary or helpful. And yet you run into it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. You are, uh, you are under a microscope, so to speak. It's almost like we're sitting at a table and somebody is traveling their eyes around people's plate. Well, oh, you don't have a whole lot on there. I think you need some more. Have you mm-hmm. tried out Gladys's salad? Here, <laughs> have that. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so um, us sort of traveling around and it could be out of a well-meaning concern for the person or even Hank Gladys, you know, thinking about it that way. But the receiving end may not be 
So right. great. And it could be very chaotic for that person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it may be that that person played it up according to what they desired. Maybe there were foods in the buffet that really looked appealing and other foods that they didn't want so much. And so to have that pointed out and commented on just has individuals feeling like they're in the spotlight and that can feel really vulnerable. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so family around the table, when you think about family and the comments they might make, um, uh, you, you mentioned one. And uh, so do you, can you think of any other ones that you can think of that's pretty common uh, on, around the table about eating and food? I think I mentioned one that was, you know, I shouldn't be eating this. I've also heard people do comments about how much they're going to have to work out because of what they're eating or what they're going to do to make up for what they've eaten, you know, which normalizes undoing behavior or compensatory behavior, which is problematic in and of itself. And so I think uh, for people to, again, be aware of comments that are being made about the food, what they're going to do to make up for the food, or why they're giving themselves permission to have particular food, instead of we're gathered around a table enjoying one another's company and time, and this is an opportunity to enjoy something pleasurable, you know, not necessarily focus on, you know, what the ingredients in it are, or how it's going to contribute to our waistline or what we're going to do to make up for it in later days. Well, yeah, I was just thinking as you were talking about the little ones and the messages that they may be getting about food and, oh, if we have this certain food or this certain amount of food means that we need to do something to mitigate the effects that it has on our body. So exercising yeah. or maybe starving uh, to make up for it, right? Or restricting calories or eating in the days, uh, uh, in the days after mm -hmm. Thanksgiving or Christmas. And also their thinking even can start beforehand. I am really going to eat a lot. So I am just not going to eat, not going to eat for the couple of days before, or even the day before. And then I'll just go to town on the, the big day. Uh, Stacy, tell us why that is not something that we recommend that you do. Right, absolutely. I, that is definitely something that we talk about, you know, in treatment when we talk about coping ahead with a holiday is encouraging people not to save up for the big meal, you know, because that I think is something that has been normalized in our culture. Like I'm going to save up, I'm going to save space. And what's not workable about that is, you know, not only is it not great for our bodies from a blood sugar standpoint and having that regulated eating that our bodies and our brains so desperately need, but oftentimes it sets us up for overeating. If we, if you think about it kind of like a pendulum, you know, if you pull a pendulum so far this way, meaning if you allow your body to get so hungry, likely it needs to swing back in equal balance the other way. And so it's going to lead to an overeating episode oftentimes, or people getting um, excessively full on foods because they allowed themselves to get excessively hungry. And so it is necessary to continue doing regulated eating throughout the days before, throughout the day of, throughout the days after, you know, for purposes of our body's balance and, you know, our overall system. Exactly. Right. So if you continue, studies have shown if you continue to eat normally on the days before and up to and during the event, you're likely to eat just the amount for your body that is necessary for you to enjoy your food and to socialize with people and to be able to get nutrition to your body. And like you said about blood sugar, keep mm -hmm. high blood sugar normal. And you really don't want low blood sugar when you're dealing with family members, because that could <laughs> cause an argument, especially if there's <laughs> drinking involved, right? You know, indeed. <laughs> I thought I would bring up a prop for you. Um, this is indeed a piece of pie. And I won't tell you what kind it is until I actually dish it up. But, but let's just say that this pie is in its pie, not just a piece, but it is in a pie. What okay. kind of thoughts do you think could come up for somebody who struggles with food and possibly fear foods? Mm -hmm. 
around a pie, an innocent pie that's sitting there without any cuts in it. And it's just there on the table. What might some people think about that and the thoughts? Absolutely. That yes, I definitely have some thoughts. And I just want to expand on a phrase you just used, that idea of fear foods. I think that is one thing that does make the holiday somewhat challenging or definitely challenging is the availability of seldom available or unique foods. And for individuals who struggle in their relationship with food, sometimes those are what we call quote unquote fear foods, you know, foods that somebody is afraid to eat because it could activate overeating. Somebody might be afraid that it's going to cause them to gain weight. Somebody might be afraid afraid that it will lead to other symptom use uh, that they've used before. So there's a lot of emotional energy associated with identified foods. And I think pie or dessert in general is definitely one of those foods. So when you ask like, what might somebody be thinking, you know, if there's pie, a buffet of pies laid out on the counter, or on the table, I think some of those initial thoughts are, am I gonna be expected to eat that? What, who made those, what's in them? Um, what if I overeat? What if I take a bite and I can't stop eating? You know, what if somebody sees me eating? What are they gonna think of me? Yeah. There's so many different thoughts that could show up for a person just around seeing the pie, not even being expected to eat it yet, just seeing the pie and the variety of different thoughts and judgments and fears that would show up, I think are noteworthy. Here we have just the innocent pie. I just want to draw everybody's perspective back to the actual truth, which is this is just a pie. The mm -hmm. pie is a trigger mm -hmm. and yet the pie is not actually doing anything. It's what your mind is doing with the pie. All yeah. of those things that Stacy just said, the, the pie is triggering the mechanism in your mind that actually mm -hmm. makes you think those things. And that's why we call it a trigger food. A trigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So what happens if I, if I take the pie and say I cut a piece of it, and so I'm noticing that this piece of pie is out for everybody to see, right? And yet, okay, it's, it's out and it's cut and it's on a plate. Um, what other kinds of thoughts do you think a person might have about it being like there and cut? Mm -hmm. Right, so again, I think there is that expect that wondering about the expectation. Am I gonna be expected to eat that? You know, is that something that they're gonna make me eat? If so, <laughs> it appears to be, apple pie. So my, the mind of somebody that's struggling, you know, would be, well, apples are fruit. So maybe that's better than chocolate pecan. So maybe if I am expected to eat pie, I could go with the apple because that I could make okay in my brain in some capacity because it is different or it has less sugar than chocolate. So essentially factoring in like, what might the ingredients be? What might be the quantity of those ingredients? How might those things affect me, my overall health, my body size, all of that different stuff. Again, just so much thought. I mentioned earlier that, you know, over 60% of the time people are thinking about what have I eaten? What will I eat? How's my appearance? And so those thoughts are just coming to the forefront, I think, as soon as we expose any food, but particularly trigger foods like desserts or sweets. You know, for some folks struggling, they may also think about like, I'll just eat the inside of the pie because I'm trying to avoid grains or carbohydrates or whatever it is. But there's all kinds of calculations and figuring and thinking about going on. Again, the pie didn't do anything. It's just sitting on the table sliced. Exactly. Right. I think if we had a comic that we could do about like a person who doesn't struggle with food or eating and the thought cloud would be, hmm, food, let's eat Thanksgiving. Yay. And then on the, on the side of a person who does struggle with food would be the thought cloud filled with all of those thoughts, those mm -hmm. analyzing thoughts, those thoughts that are just a preoccupation uh, with the food and with eating right. and the effects and trying to do all the analysis. I think people would be really surprised that all that thought goes into 
a person who just seems to be sitting there at the table. Right, right. I think there's so much. I think the cl- thought cloud is a fantastic pictorial, dis- you know, viewing of it. And to think about it too, is it's just so much noise, so much noise going on in the mind of the individual that is preoccupied with that. And so if a person is thinking about the pie and thinking about what they've already eaten, because that would show up like, oh, I already ate so much dinner. I can't possibly eat more pie again, because of how it might affect me or what might occur as a result of that. So family members or the people spending the holiday with an individual may experience them as less present or as, you know, distracted or wonder what are they thinking about because they don't seem to be listening to me. And some of it can be some of that mental dialogue that's going on or some of that noise that's getting in the way of their ability to engage fully. And when your thoughts are that full, it's like a computer screen when you keep pressing the buttons, it overwhelms the brain and the brain sort of shuts down. And sometimes we do see the vacant look like overboard, overwhelm. And people do go through emotional and mental chaos, just thinking all of those thoughts. And so that's just when the pie is sliced up and not even on your plate. But what if somebody dishes it up and says, Here you go. <laughs> it's yours now. Right. And I uh, think about is. folks that are actively struggling in their relationship with food and the level of overwhelm is a word you use, the level of fear, maybe even going so far as terror. I've seen people freeze in the presence of food or have a really large breakdown, you know, because it's just intolerable. And other folks may be able to contain those experiences, you know, while internally panicking about this food that's being offered to them. You know, so they might accept it gracefully uh, and then have difficulty with navigating how am I going to get away with eating as little of this as possible? Or, you know, what if I eat this piece and then I want more? You know, so again, there's just that that dialogue going on internally for a person that decreases their experience of enjoyment in the moment. Exactly. Right. So what would we say, this is kind of going back into more of the coping about this. So what would we say that a person could do is like, say, this is the scenario. It's been a long evening of eating and I'm pretty full. And I had some of that marshmallowy stuff and some sweet potatoes at uh, dinner and I'm pretty good. I really don't need dessert, but somebody puts some pie in front of me and I'm thinking, I can't eat another bite, I'll explode. You know, something like that from Monty Python, for those of you Mm -hmm. who know that. And so what could this person do or say, somebody has placed the pie in the hands, put a fork even on a plate and even said something about Aunt Gladys again, you know? So what is it that we could maybe from this point of view say or do with this pie? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important. And this is true of people, you know, who do struggle in their relationship with food, but also other folks that don't, that feel, you know, fine and neutral toward food. I think one thing about holidays, you know, or any days that are a little bit food centric, I think it is still important to attend to our own body's actual experience of fullness and hunger, you know? And so I think having respect for individuals that might say no, you know, like I'm actually really full. I, I'm not going to have any pie. Thank you. You know, like, I think it's completely okay to decline the offer of food, if your body is ex- expressing fullness, you know, if your body is saying like, mm, I'm actually good, or maybe I'll have some later. So I think giving ourselves and other folks permission to decline, I think is necessary and attending to our own body's physical cues when it comes to hunger or fullness is also really necessary and relevant. Yeah. So noticing if you really truly have had enough, and do want to stop eating and creating those clear like food boundaries, I guess you, you'd want to call them. Yeah. And then to other people to just really uh, implore them to respect other people's food boundaries. You know, we are not 
uh, we are not food pushers, I guess, or yeah. food um, ensurers that you get enough because we want to really empower people to make their own choices about food and, and their bodies uh, regarding hunger, fullness, what we're going to eat, when we're going to eat, and all right. that other stuff. And on that topic, it's just on my heart to say, uh, on the flip side, if somebody is having a second piece of pie, for example, you know, I think family members might make a comment like, oh, you're having another piece or wow, haven't you already had two pieces of pie or whatever it is. So again, going back to that, stay on your own plate, stay focused on your own self and avoiding making comments about other people's eating because we don't know how it's going to land. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. How, why don't you leave some for the rest of us, Uncle Bob, right? Something like that. <laughs> yes. yes. Well-meaning and maybe lighthearted, but poor Uncle Bob may not be feeling so great about it. So you never Absolutely. know who's going to be on the receiving end of those, those comments. So. Yeah. so I so, like what you said about respecting people's choices, you know, on all the time, but on these food centric holidays that res allow people to know what's best for them. Yeah. yeah, so whether they whether they take the pie and eat it or whether they decide not to, we can cope ahead for these things or, you know, we know our families, right? We know this is the food pusher and she's gonna be there. And this is the person who's gonna make the comments that could be potentially hurtful and he's mm -hmm. gonna be there. And so what we can do is we can think about what our responses are going to be in advance and have that little, I don't know, sort of dictionary of things that uh, scenario A is this, and this would be my response. Sometimes it's necessary for relatives because if you know what they're going to say, you can cope ahead with, yeah. with uh, your own actions and behaviors, I think. Right. And I think that phrase, cope ahead, or that skill, you know, in the case that people aren't aware of what that is, it is identifying in advance situations that might be challenging and knowing what skills we'd use, you know, so it isn't catastrophizing, it isn't worrying about the worst case scenario, it's just acknowledging what might be challenging and imagining ourselves coping with that well. And so if Aunt Gladys is going to be over serving or pushing, you know, to have certain items or to eat more, whatever it is, knowing how we might respond in advance, so it is more of a default as opposed to something that we're coming up with on the fly. And I think that most coping ahead plans that I've developed with my clients anyway, include a safety plan to where they can actually have a, not an exit strategy to where I'm getting in the car and leaving, but a safe zone if it is a room or even outside and just to be able to catch a couple of breaths and calm down and get your chaos calmed uh, and just be able to breathe a little bit and maybe even get out of the atmosphere of the food and the people for even just a couple of minutes really yeah. does work for sure. Mm -hmm. I think for individuals that can anticipate some holiday distress or some difficulty, having a person, you know, as their maybe identified support person or whatever, and that person doesn't need to be there. It can be, I happen to have my phone next to me. It can be a person that you plan with in advance. Hey, if I text you for support, you know, please know that I'm just looking for some validation or some encouragement or whatever that is, um, you know, or even a quick phone call call could be nice. Or like you said, taking a break might be necessary just to get out of what feels like chaos in those moments. And your support systems can be called and contacted. Mm -hmm. And you can also access them within your own self when you think about, oh, I really want to text Stacy right now. Uh, what if she doesn't answer right away? What would she say? What would yeah. she tell me in this moment to mm -hmm. help me be encouraged? So you can be your own Stacy to yourself, you know, your own mm -hmm. best friend. You can, you can talk to yourself as if your friend was there. You can, of course, still text them as well or do whatever, mm -hmm. but I think that it's a really useful skill to develop a way of talking to yourself that's more compassionate and best friend-like through these sorts of uh, events, for sure. 
Yes, I think what you and I both know, Tracy, is that people don't often talk to themselves nicely, or that isn't always their go-to method of talking to themselves. So I think being able to have a non-judgmental, non-critical, self-compassion lens is so important. Uh, so we are talking to ourselves more like a best friend or as if we would to a younger person, you know, because so often people are unkind to themselves internally. And if we can flip that dialogue and make it more helpful in those moments, I think it helps us navigate so much more effectively. Yeah, I, uh, I really agree with that for sure, because uh, just practicing regularly self-compassion is always a really good thing to do. I think people do affirmations, sometimes those work, and just anything that can build you up and encourage you. And then we're more resilient to be able to cope with any kind of negativity that comes our way. We're able to stand up for ourselves, not in a defensive way, but in a very truthful and helpful way for ourselves, uh, for sure. Yes. There's one skill that I really wanted to bring up earlier, and I just remembered now, so I want to bring it up. And yes. it's about staying out of the web. This is a tip for people who are support systems, for people who struggle with food related uh, challenges or even body image uh, challenges. So WEB being an acronym, uh, for stay out of the web, right? I'm envisioning a spider being in the web. Of course. Uh, yeah, of course. And so the W is weight. So comments about weight or any kind of numbers are best left behind and alone and not mentioned. So staying out of the mentioning of specific body weights or the E is gonna be the eating behaviors, you know, what's on your plate, how much you're eating, like Stacy was talking about, poor Uncle Bob had two, two pieces of pie and got ribbed by, you know, Uncle Jim. And so, <laughs> yeah, so, so the E is about eating behaviors and B is any uh, inference or comments about body shape or size. And so in general, if you keep to those three rules, people who are, family members and just really don't understand why your family member over here is struggling with food, just keeping within those three parameters is often helpful. I like that very much. I think that's sage advice and really valuable. I also think depending on when this conversation you know, is released, if people have the time and the openness in relationships, if, you, if people know that somebody in their family or a loved one that is spending the food center holiday with them, uh, if they could approach that person about what would be supportive, what might be helpful for you on this day, because each person is so individual. And there are some folks that might benefit from not having a whole buffet of food out for hours, you know, so it might be let's actually box that up after the meal. So it's not just out and about for us to continue nibbling on that could be really activating. Other people might say, you know, I'd really appreciate having quote unquote, big meal at regular meal time, you know, like at five o'clock or at six o'clock, mm -hmm. which is kind of different than what a lot of families do and eating at two o'clock. But that way you can keep that regular schedule and it can be just quote unquote, another meal, you know, because that is what it is, but we've made it into something that is the feast of Thanksgiving instead of it's dinner that includes some traditional foods, you know, or lunch if that's what's opted for. Right. So if people have the opportunity and openness in relationship to ask about what would be helpful, what would be something that you'd like for us to avoid, you know, and is there anything by way of support that you might need from me? I think those could be really valuable. I know some of my clients have had family members do that for them and they really appreciated that because it really shows that they care and that they want the person to be successful mm -hmm. on the holiday because it is a tough time for a lot of people for the reasons that we've talked about so far mm -hmm. in, in this show, for sure. Yeah. Well, is there any other tips or tools that we haven't mentioned or any triggers and, uh, and success stories that you are thinking of? Or have we covered everything? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think to cover everything between you and I, Trace, would probably take a little more time because yeah. we could just have lots of different ideas. Um, but I think just to highlight some of the, the things that we have 
talked about is attunement with our own bodies, you know, and practicing mindfulness of hunger and fullness and allowing ourselves to let that dictate food related choices, I think can be really helpful, both for those struggling and who, those who are not. I think staying out of the web is fantastic. Being non judgmental and compassionate, it can be really necessary. Um, and Maybe being flexible, I would probably add to it because sometimes there is a lot of different things that are happening. And for an individual, you know, that is going in with, it needs to be this way in order for me to get through it successfully, you know, oftentimes there's things that change. And so we need to be able to be flexible and then mindful of what our needs are in different moments of the day. Yes, the key is mindfulness. Be open, be aware, non judgmentally, sort of observe and notice what's happening in the present moment, like Kitty Cat. Kitty oh, Cat noticing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, I like that kitty. I don't think I've met that kitty cat. This is Ziggy. Z oh, I used to have a cat named Ziggy as well. Yes, he, I think we got him two years ago my son adopted him and he's a, quite a brilliant cat he's a great cat well yeah. see now stacy is just paying attention to what's showing up in the moment which is mindfulness she's actually petting her cat scratching her cat ziggy and so <laughs> she's sort of noticing how his fur probably feels and we're going to notice maybe his butt in a minute if we're <laughs> <laughs> oh yes show that butt well, you're so noticing many, way, right? so many cat butts on virtual platforms. <laughs> this is so great because it, it, and it's so interesting how there are no accidents. And just as we talk about mindfulness, we are mindful of our pet. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. And I think in that same way, we're going to use the cat as an example. I think being able to notice other internal experiences in the same way that we just did my cat that jumped up on the chair. You know, we might have an internal experience of a thought or an internal experience of an emotion or an internal experience of some kind of physical cue. And I think being able to notice all of those things neutrally and non judgmentally and decide, you know, with a wise mind, you know, what we want to do with that experience can, I think, really guide us. And so, Stacy, is there anything that you want to plug about your work or about any kind of programs that you're doing now? Now is the time to tell the viewers what you've been up to and what's been happening for you. Sure, I can do that. Um, thank you for that opportunity. So I would just say, as Tracy mentioned in the introduction, I do work at the EMILY program. I am the site director at the South Sound location. And right now with everything in place due to the pandemic, we're actually offering all of our services virtually. So we're doing an intensive level of care called PHP six hours a day, five days a week. Um, for those who need that level of care, we're doing intensive outpatient, three hours a day, four days a week. And then we're also doing outpatient services. And I just really like encouraging people to be honest with themselves about their own lived experience and what might be happening with them in their relationship with food or their relationship with their bodies and access support and services if that seems relevant or helpful. You can also, or people can also participate in just a evaluation, you know, make an appointment for an evaluation and talk about what their experience is. And at the end of that evaluation, a person certified in, you know, treating eating disorders would let them know, hey, this is what I'd recommend. What you do with that recommendation is up to you. But based on what you've told me, I do recommend that. Along with the services that we provide for individuals struggling with eating disorders, we also provide friends and family support, we provide eating disorder education, and those are available, you know, to individuals that are supporting an individual struggling, and they occur three times a month um, virtually. So anybody can access those. Those are available on the EMILY program's website under the Four Families tab. So I while I don't love being in the situation that we are with COVID-19, 
I think has opened up a lot of opportunities for people to access the care that they need, no matter kind of where they are, because um, we have different levels of care offered virtually from the comfort of their own secure environment, um, you know, at different levels, sorry, different times of the day. And those can be really accessible, which I think is necessary right now for people. Yeah, it is. And so it's a different world that we're living in, right? And yes. we are adapting and being flexible, just as you were talking about earlier. And yeah. I love it. Yeah. So, and thank you guys so much for being present in the South Sound, in Olympia, Lacey area. And we really appreciate just the hard work that you're doing and adapting to all this COVID stuff and still trying to help people navigate their relationships with food and improve them. Mm -hmm. Well, and likewise, while I get, you know, the mic, I will say thank you for everything you're doing, Tracy. I think the Calming the Chaos podcast is so valuable for folks and obviously the work that you continue to do in outpatient and in our community, I think is so valuable. So thank you for all that you do. Yes, well, you you and I are colleagues and collaborators, and um, so it's always nice to talk with you and to meet Ziggy the cat and <laughs> and uh, see how um, mindfulness can come into play just in that <laughs> little moment with with Ziggy and you and Absolutely. and I hope you have a, a happy holiday. Um, and whatever it is that you do, wherever it is that you go, stay safe and to your family as well. Thank you to you as well and whomever you spend Thanksgiving with. I hope it's wonderful and a good holiday season overall. Yes. Take care. We'll be in touch. <laughs> Thanks, Trace. I always love talking with Stacy. She's so enthusiastic and passionate about her work and funny. And I even got to meet one of her pets. The only bummer thing is, is after we recorded our session, I ate the pie and I recorded it, but it didn't come out. And so I had this really great segment to share with you about the pie and it didn't come out. So maybe next time we'll do an actual eating segment. In the meantime, take care and thank you for tuning in to Calming the Chaos. Thank you for listening to Calming the Chaos. If the information in today's podcast was helpful, please consider subscribing and share it with your friends. You can find this podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. You can also go to my website at www.lokahicounseling.com for more resources for calming your mental and emotional chaos. This includes a CD I created that teaches you how to practice mindfulness in less than 10 minutes. So check it out. Thanks again for listening. And I look forward to sharing my next podcast episode with you. In the meantime, take care.